This is a view from the bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. Telling stories to teach supernatural, spiritual truth. Straight ahead on a view from the bunker. Space is not the final frontier, but there are those who want you to think it is. 75 years ago, something crashed in the desert near Roswell, New Mexico. An industry has grown up to sell the idea that the pilots were extraterrestrials. We want you to know the truth. For a limited time, we're making available a special offer featuring the groundbreaking book, The Day the Earth Stands Still. This book shows step-by-step step how the occult teachings of Madame Blavatsky and Aleister Crowley grew into the ancient aliens hypothesis of the modern UFO movement. It's our Gilbert House Roswell Special. For just $35, we'll send you The Day the Earth Stands Still, plus our DVD sets, The Best of Sci Friday, Volumes 1 and 2. It's a $65 value for just $35. Take advantage of the Gilbert House Roswell Special for a limited time only, and you'll only find it at our store, online at gilberthouse.org. Jesus used storytelling in the form of parables to teach spiritual truths. And certainly the enemy, the fallen realm, has uh, used storytelling to great effect. From The Da Vinci Code to 2001 A Space Odyssey, E.T., uh, Close Encounters of the Fourth Kind, uh, b basically anything coming out of Hollywood that deals with the supernatural, teaching a false, a wrong cosmology. So why do we as Christians not do more with storytelling? Joining me today are a pair of brothers who are trying to do just that. They were gracious enough to have me on their podcast not long ago, uh, The Goslings, so-called Goslings with two S's. You'll see why in just a moment. I love the tagline for their podcast, Interviews That Strike Down the Darkness. They're the sons of Gospel Music Hall of Famer Larry Goss. Uh, Nick started his writing career in 2018 when his kids got old enough that uh, he needed to use epic levels of creativity to keep them entertained. And now that has led to a series of books called The Traveler's League, book one, The Timepiece, and his brother Jonathan, who raised in a home with strong theological background, a lot of church uh, mixed uh, background, his upbringing with a love for fantastical storytelling and medieval warfare. And that has uh, turned into the six books of the Heavenly Realms series. Six novels so far, beginning with Empyrean Falling, which I've just begun to read. And uh, we welcome to the program for the first time, Nick and Jonathan Goss. Nick, Jonathan, welcome to the bunker. Hey, Derek. Thanks for having us. Hey, thank you. At least I could do. Uh, not least, I mean, you guys were gracious enough to have me on your program, but seeing that you guys are uh, prolific writers of fiction from a Christian worldview, um, we need to stick together and, and talk this up a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll get into what inspires you and how you all got started on this, but uh, I just want to get your, your sense of where... Christian fiction is today because the last real close dealings that Sharon and I had with it was back in 2002, 2003, mm. as we were starting to write a series, the two of us together, where we were writing in the same fictional universe, writing mm. independently oh. of each other, but sharing plot points and sharing characters. Oh, that's cool. And now here we are in 2022, 20 years later, we're actually coming yeah. back to that uh, idea and uh, we're going to actually work her Red Wing saga into this uh, series that started back in 02 with her novel, uh, Winds of Evil. But cool. um, we found as we attended the uh, Christian Bookseller Association convention in Atlanta, and then she mm -hmm. attended an, a second one in uh, Nashville. Uh, I was tied up uh, doing something else. And our, our sense was that Christian fiction was mainly um, stories about Amish women. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, yeah. Have, uh -huh. have things changed? I mean, we've we've essentially published our own stuff now since since then, since about 2007. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I've not really paid that much attention, quite honestly. There's not much in the way of Christian fiction that I found all that interesting. What yeah. what is it like these days? Yeah. Well, I, I'll if you don't mind me jumping no, in go there. For it. Yeah. yeah. No, it's funny you say Amish women because uh, <laughs> when when I go to I've gone to uh, the homeschool conference. Because I'm a homeschool dad, uh, teach them diligently, and they have an enormous uh, uh, section downstairs where they're you know all you know hundreds of booths, and uh, most of the people represented at those conferences are people of faith, they're Christians, uh, for the most part, 
And a lot of these booths are selling Christian fiction. And the reason that it's so frustrating finding anything written recently that's Christian fiction, and it all kind of falls into that giant. It's always like the Amish women or the frontier <laughs> woman mm-hmm. uh, uh, or or it's just Bible stories, repackaged Bible stories for kids. Mm-hmm. And it, it – Samson and Delilah yeah. with, uh, with the football player and the cheerleader. Yeah, you know? mm, kind of. Yeah. But I mean, if, if they even get that creative with it, oh. uh, you know, it's I think what's happened is that at least in middle grade, at least in the genre that I write in. There has been this enormous infusion of secular values and leftist values mm. that are infiltrating middle grade fiction and. It's been infiltrating young adults, the next age group up, for a long, long time. So there's nothing wholesome out there that parents can trust that's secular. And when they see something that looks and smells or might they might suspect is kind of secular, that doesn't neatly fit these, you know, check all the boxes of what they have in their mind as Christian fiction, they kind of avoid it. So I think a lot of Christian authors are, you know, trying to sell low hanging fruit, something that looks and smells and seems wholesome. They want something wholesome for their kids. So if it's not something like if it's not the, you know, pioneer women or Amish women, it's something that uh was written, you know, the C. S. Lewis's, mm. the the Tolkien's, um, stories written in the nineteenth century that are that are wholesome. Uh, So they're kind of like falling on these. Pilgrim's progress. Yeah. And the other thing, and this is what drives me nuts, is that they're afraid to write. They're afraid. There's nothing that's like creative as far as fantasy goes. They don't want to. They don't want to jump into fantasy because they're afraid that they're going to create some universe that might cross the boundaries of what people understand the spiritual world to be in reality. You know, they don't they, – they're afraid to, you know, entertain the idea that, you know, there could be multiple deities in a story because it might confuse the reader. Well, there's only one God. Yeah, but this is fiction. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah. And that they, – they don't want to tell something that's not completely in line with, you know, what they believe about the Bible. That's a one-to-one translation. Right. Um, and so it's hard for you to say, you know, it's fiction. I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a fictional story. But everything has to doctrinally align with yeah. Scripture. They can't stray from that. So the time piece is out because of the Minotaur, basically. Yeah, basically. Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah. My yeah. book. Yeah. So super yeah. fun. Yeah, yeah. So in which all is, my books, I have those. those which those which is too bad. I just started reading the time piece and Empyrean Falling, by the way, um, uh-huh. and looking forward to getting deeper into those. Um, but uh, yeah, the Minotaur is something that Sharon has actually worked into one of her Red Wing saga novels. Very wow, cool. Awesome. Yeah. But when you well, look then, you look back at ancient uh, Mesopotamian iconography, the uh, uh-huh. artwork that depicts their gods and supernatural characters, and the bull men, the kusariku, were hmm. a common uh, theme. And, and when you look at the uh, you know the, the cherubim or cherubim, the Hebrews pronounce it, uh, or the Isra- Israelis pronounce it that way, uh, there it's pretty clear from Ezekiel chapter ten. Ezekiel 1 and 10, when you compare the descriptions of the uh, uh, the cherubim, that uh, there is a definite bovid appearance to those things. So mm-hmm. I, I don't see why the Minotaur would be that far out of bounds. And wouldn't the, uh, it, and uh, I believe in Revelation, I think it's Revelation, or Daniel, I can't remember which one, but it describes one of the four spirits around the throne has the appearance of a bull as well. And uh, and that's, you know, one of the four chair, one of the throne guardians. Oh yeah, has that appearance, if I'm not mistaken, and it seems like a lot of the uh, Baal worship too. You right. know, the uh, well, not just Baal worship, but uh, a- ancient pag- pagan worship from the region. You know, the the idols were always bulls, yeah. Jeroboam, the golden calf, oh, right, like, right. I mean, the chief, the chief god of Canaan, uh, his his main epithet was Bull El, and oh, yeah. uh, scholars have uh, dug deeper and found that the. Uh, <laughs> probable origin of the name Titan for the old gods of the Greeks who were banished to uh, Tartarus. It was the name of an ancient Amorite tribe called the Tidanu, who were so hmm. frightening to the ancient Sumerians. The last Sumerian kings of Mesopotamia, the third dynasty of Ur, built a wall 175 miles long to try to make Sumer great again and keep the Tidanu out. And uh, it didn't work, obviously, because the kingdom fell around the time that Abraham was born. But uh, that word, Tadanu, comes from the Akkadian word for bison or aurochs or bull. 
Wow. So there's a very wow. old, if Kronos, in fact, comes from the Semitic word uh, karen or karnu, mm-hmm. that means horns, mm-hmm. the horned one. So yeah, yeah there, there's a very old uh, imagery, some very old imagery there. Um, but when, yeah. and, and when you start digging into the Bible, I mean, that's, that's a, a, a thing that most of us have not been taught in churches, angelology. Mm-hmm. I mean, the seraphim, yeah. the cherubim, the wheels within wheels, the ophanim, mm-hmm. the malachim. Um, you, you dive into this a lot in your, your Heavenly Realm series, Jonathan, uh, the, the nature of the angelic realm. Um, yeah. How, how uh, inspired were you by the depictions of the Bible and how far did you have to go outside of the Bible to kind of inform your description of those supernatural characters? You know, I took a very, this always disappoints people, I took a very anthropomorphic approach because um, I had a friend, or I have a friend, who did that with a movie script version of what he was, uh, of the same kind of story. And um, I found it to be sort of like what Matt Stone and Trey Parker have depicted in the past, or, or what they say is like, you don't want a hat on top of a hat. You know, you can have, you can wear a hat. But then if you put a hat on a hat, it's weird. You know, one hat's cool. Two hats is weird. And like I was trying to tell this this very intense cosmic drama, you know, of the fall of Lucifer. And in these books, it's sort of simplified the transformation into Satan, you know, and the and the leading of the one third into a rebellion. And uh, I wanted to do that at first. I had this idea of having all these mythological creatures, like my friend who was writing the, you know, um, the movie script. Uh, well, I shouldn't say mythological, but biblically fantastical, you know, creatures. Um, and then I realized, like, for me at least, maybe it's my limitation as a writer. Like, I couldn't, <clears throat> I couldn't make that work. Maybe I'm not creative enough, but like, I couldn't make that work. From a dramatic sense. Mm. So what I ended up doing was crafting a very fictionalized narrative, which is sort of explained in the author's note in the beginning that like, look, this is a fictional interpretation. This is not meant to supersede anything in the Bible. But I basically dress them up in human garb so that it would become more accessible. You know, uh, now there are monsters in the Heavenly Realm series. Um, one of them uh, actually, coincidentally, is kind of uh, a bull god of sorts, Mazarel. Mm-hmm. Uh, he is my creation uh, from whole cloth. <clears throat> he's just he's like my version of like I wanted a bad guy who could be Satan's right hand man who could do all the terrible things that I can't really have Satan do because he's still tr- he's embodying Lucifer and he's trying to be like this, you know, magnanimous, you know, um, savior type, you know, mm-hmm. but you still need a bad guy who can just like be vicious, mm-hmm. you know, the scourge of the faithful. So I created this character, Masriel, who ends up looking like a minotaur in a lot, <laughs> in a lot of ways. He is like, yeah. he's like, if yeah. you mix Hellboy with Satan from South Park yeah. and, you know, and like a minotaur all into one, you know? Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. So it, it's funny how, like, even when you try to, diverge from that and create something that's going to be more accessible. And a lot of people really liked the fact that the angels are, they look like us, you know, in the heavenly realm series. A lot of people also did not, they were disappointed by it, you know, but it's like, even in your attempt to anthropomorphize and make this as accessible as possible, Mm -hmm. you still end up coming right back around (laughs) to like the thing that you avoided and doing the very (laughs) thing that you avoided in the first place. And it worked out beautifully, but it was like, if I did too many of those, for me, I felt like I probably would have I probably would have failed at it for my own writing ability, especially at the time, because I started these when I was 17. Mm, yeah. So, yeah, I was ironically been writing a long time. I was at Lighthouse. I went to Lighthouse Christian, a little Baptist, uh, you know, uh, prep school uh, in Antioch, Tennessee. And uh, and I was sitting there in chapel class junior year ignoring the sermon that the principal was preaching and just started writing that first scene chapter one um in the beginning of empyrean falling when uh when lucifer is talking to the seraph maildus you know and, mm-hmm. and it just sort of blossomed out from there so i think if i had done it later especially after reading your stuff and gary wayne's stuff i probably would have been more adventurous 
I probably would have like had the chops to make it weirder. You know what I mean? <laughs> you so. know, the, Sharon and I were just talking about that this afternoon because uh, I've gone back and I've started rereading some of her older stuff and my older stuff. Um, the the God conspiracy. We- 